Good morning. Yeah, so Point Church family, thank you for being here. Those of you that are joining us here in the church and those of you who are in line, it's really, really glad. I'm really glad to have you here today. Sorry, I'm a little choked up over Dennis. He was uh, one of my first mentors, so good guy. But he's, he's where he's supposed to be. So my name is JC. I'm one of the pastors here at The Point. Thank you for being here again. And church, why are we here? We, we reiterate this every week. Why? Tim just talked about it. This is, this is a legacy that we want to leave for those generations that are beyond us, just like Dennis did for us. The Point Church exists to welcome the unchurched to become fully devoted followers of Jesus, right? We point people to God and we worship him with everything that we have. We point people to Jesus to receive and give the love, acceptance, and forgiveness that he's shown us. And we point people to the community, to the church, to the church family, to encourage and equip one another. So it's an awesome privilege to be able to bring you the second sermon in this five-sermon series called At War. We are at war. It's about the full armor of God. This sermon that I'm doing today is on Ephesians 6, verse 17, one verse. But it won't be that short of a sermon, I promise. So it's on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. My hope is that we can gain some knowledge and wisdom and the power of God through Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit through this. Are you ready to be strengthened for this fight? Because whether you realize it or not, we are at war. We're in a fight daily. But this fight that we're, I'm sorry, and, but this is where the armor of God comes into play, right? And you have to remember that this battle that we're in, this fight that we're in, is not against each other. You know, we think about evil in the world. Sometimes we think about evil people, and maybe they're working for Satan. But our fight is not against each other. It is against the spiritual realm of the devil. And he has got power and dominion over this world. In Ephesians 2, he's called the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens. The spirit now working in the disobedient, who we were once part of, and he wants nothing more than to trick us into thinking that we can fight this fight alone, without armor, and against each other. So you know there's many times in my life where I've just felt overwhelmed, and it's usually because I figure that I can just fix what's going wrong in my life myself. And if I fight hard enough and long enough, I will win the battle. But I can tell you from experience, that doesn't happen very often. When I find myself worn out completely, God reminds me of some things. I wish I would listen sooner. But God reminds me, this is amazing, God reminds me of the day I was saved. When I find out, when I get to that point where I'm totally worn out and I just can't take it anymore, God says, you remember that day you were saved? It's like, yeah, I do. Because sometimes I need to be reminded of what it was like to have be in God's full power, not my own. But I get going on life and my path that I think is going to work. I go under my own power. It doesn't work. And my memory is terrible for most, thing, most things, but I remember that day vividly. We were at our life group, October 9th, 2000, my wife and I, Ruth, and we were going through the Gospels and we just kept hearing about being born again and being saved and, you know, sometimes those are churchy words. So my, I thank God for my wife. She's like, so what does it actually mean? I'm, we've heard them and we, maybe we know, but we're not sure. And they explained that to us. And that was the day that we learned to fight a different battle. We didn't realize how difficult that could be though at that point. But we started to fight a different battle in our lives. And I'm also reminded by the Holy Spirit when I'm not in his word, when I break away and, and 
just get busy in my life and don't have time to put time into his word because his word gives me strength and confidence. I might not be able to remember much or trust much in this life, but I know I can trust Jesus fully, even if I got to be reminded sometimes. And one more thing, this is really important that I get reminded of by God, is my need for other people in my life to help me in this battle. Again, my natural bent is to do it alone. And Satan likes to use that natural bent to trick me, trick me into thinking that I can do it. But I can't. But this armor that God has given us, it's compounded when we have other Christians by our side to help fight in this battle. We're not alone. So I have a question. I actually, I have a couple of questions for you today. Do you believe the devil is real? Yeah. How real? I mean, is he just like, yeah, he's there, but... Do you believe that he really does things in your life to mess it up? Yeah. So do you believe that he's stronger than you? Than me? Yes. He's stronger than every one of us. I guarantee that. And so then, if you do, what, how do we win this battle? You know, the spiritual realm is definitely real. And we need to learn to recognize it for what it is. Who we're fighting and what, what tools we need, our armor. So why don't we open in prayer and see if we can figure this out. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for giving us life, for loving us more than we can ever possibly deserve. <coughs> we thank you for giving us your son, and I pray that our hearts and minds are open to your leading today and that you uh, just continue holding Satan from our lives. Father, we love you. Amen. So what I actually, uh, my, my sermon is on Ephesians chapter 6, 17, verse 17, but I'm going to summarize chapter 6, 1 through 5, before I get there, because I think it's all important. I think it's all part of it. Um, the first couple of chapters in Ephesians talks about the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead and into heaven and sat, him at, and sat at his right-hand side. And I want to point out something incredible. Not only to already saved Christians, but people that are looking to be or look, you know, seeking what it means to be a follower of Christ and what it is like to trust him. Because I remember that, that line in the sand when I crossed. So this is for all of us. There's nothing that you can do on your own to be worthy of God accepting you as one of his own. Nothing. What can you do? Can you think of something, anything that you can do to make you worthy of God? Ephesians 2, chapter uh, 2, 4 to 10 says... But God is so rich in mercy and loved us so much that even though we were dead in our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And it's only by his grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because, this is, this is said a couple of times, because we are united with Jesus Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all that he's done for us, us who are united with Christ. God saved you by grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for that. It's only a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done. No, otherwise we would boast about it, right? Right? Because we are God's masterpiece and he created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do those good things that he had planned for us way long ago. So then how can you be confident that you're working under God's power and not your own? Well, because we are his masterpiece. Literally, he created us for a purpose and we should have full faith that God the Father will carry out that plan 
because he made us. I think there's two verses that kind of help along the road of faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, Hebrews 3.6. It says now, 11.1 1 says, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for. Now, in, the, in a normal sense in, the, in English or the world, confidence and hope don't really go together, do they? Because like, I hope I get home. I hope my car makes it home today. Well, I'm definitely not sure of that. It's got a, quite a few miles on it. But confidence in heaven? Now that is assured. Faith in God to have a place for you in heaven through the work of Jesus dying on that cross. And Hebrews 3, 6 says, Christ was faithful as a son over his household. And we are that household if we hold on to the courage and the confidence of our hope. Our hope is what? It's heaven. It's an assurity. And so you can hold on. You can be courageous. Doesn't mean you're brave. Just means you do the right thing even when there's some fear involved. So again, this fight is not with each other. It's in the it's with the spirit, it's a spiritual fight against the devil and his demons. But we are God's masterpiece, and he created us for a purpose. And then he sent his son to earth to show us how to fight this battle so that we know how to win along with each other. And that work, that the important work was completely done, already done when he died on that cross, but rose from death to life to give us the assurance that we belong to him or that he wants us, if we're not there yet, to belong in his family. And that's all by God's love and grace. And he continues to protect us, who he calls us children. So it's, we can have assurance that God wants us in his family because he sent his only son to do the work for us. He loves us and we should be unified with him. The next couple of chapters talk about <clears throat> the church is a body and a family in a close relationship with one another, treating each other kindly with grace. Unity is the key of these chapters, if you can see it. If, if we're not in unity with one another or the Lord, it's gonna be difficult to accomplish anything for him. And I wanna to point to the Gospel of John chapter 17 is another chapter that calls us into unity. It's Jesus praying to God the Father. That's important. He's praying that we would be one with him as he is one with him. And so unity in the family of God as Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one with the Father, so we should be. That makes sense, right? He actually prayed that for us. I think it's huge. So do you have that same mindset of unity with the body of Christ, with other Christians, now maybe you think it's unity with God, but do you have that same unity mindset with other Christians? Or do you feel like it's a broken family? Because truthfully, we talk about that. We, we're broken people, right? But we don't necessarily have to be a broken family. Unity is a choice that you make. So, if, if you think you're being taken advantage of by other people, especially other Christians, you know, maybe you're trying to hang on to those things for yourself rather than give them away. So if Jesus was a servant and we're supposed to be like Jesus, right? You willingly offer your services to others in Christ, through Christ. That way, you're not being taken advantage of. You're giving it as a gift, as a servant. So offering yourself makes sense to me because God calls me to that, right? I know my sermon is about the full armor of God and I assure you this, is, this all ties in because with any pieces missing in your armor, it's ineffective and you're left vulnerable. We're a family working together for the good of God's kingdom, not our own. It said, let it be on earth as it is in heaven, right? Amen? The power of, the power of God is given, us, given to us individually, yeah, 
But it's also given to us, even more importantly, as a body, collectively. Each of us have our strengths and our weaknesses, our gifts from God. If we stand together in unity as a whole body, the power of God working through us, man, that's incredible. We can overcome evil with good and defeat the devil. Now, and I'm not talking that we're strong enough to defeat the devil, but with God's help, with his power, we can do that. But if we're not in unity with one another and the Lord, Satan's got us right where he wants us, literally. He's got you. So it's unity with Christ, unity with the Lord, and unity with the body of Christ. The last couple of chapters deals with following the example of Christ and others in the family of God who also follow the family of Christ or the example of Christ. So Jesus is called the king, right? But he chose to live as a commoner like us. He chose to get rid of that kingship and live just like we are to show us that we can live life that way. It can happen. It talks about the contrast between darkness and light. And I think this is incredibly important. We used to be called children of the darkness, but now we are called children of the light. And I want to jump to Genesis chapter 1 for a minute to show you how powerful light is. So the earth was formless and void. Darkness covered the surface of the deep. It covered everything. So there was no light. Because the next one says, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And he saw that the light was good. God brought the light into the darkness. And the darkness cannot extinguish the light. That's how powerful it is. Anybody afraid of the dark? You don't have to raise your hands. I will. I used to be. When I was growing up as a kid, I was deathly afraid of the dark. I thank God. It's only by his grace that I am no longer afraid of the dark. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Ah, oh, man, if I'm walking through a dark hallway, I don't know if I'm going to trip on something and I can get in my own way just as easy as anybody else can. So there's a little bit of angst, but I, it's not like a deathly fear. So let's get into that. God is, God is all light, right? God gave us the light so we didn't have to be afraid anymore. And Jesus is called the light of the world. So we can be confident because we can see what he is doing in our lives. In the light, we can also see what the enemy is doing. That's, that's super important because he can't just sneak up on us. Oh, thanks. <laughs> that's not going to work. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> on top of my sermon. <clears throat> so we can be confident that we can see what God is doing in our lives and we can be confident that we know what the enemy is doing in our lives. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that, right? But God is all light. Jesus is the light of the world. If we're following them, there's no way we can not see what's happening. And so he doesn't leave us in the dark. He also doesn't leave us alone and without armor. He gives us everything that we need to fight this battle because our adversary, Satan, Satan is stronger than we are. I love saying it that way. I just remember that from Saturday Night Live. So we also get this community of believers, a family of God known as the church to stand by our side in this battle. Otherwise, we have the tools we need, the armor of God. And not to mention, what else? A host of angels standing by our side, fighting with us. But if you try to fight this fight, this battle by yourself, I don't know, maybe you think that you're not worthy enough to ask other people for help. You don't think, you think you're gonna, they're gonna make fun of you or you, whatever it is, you're gonna lose this battle. Being next to each other as a community of believers, 
with God, with the armor, with Jesus, with the host of angels, that's how we can win. And so, you know, if you bought battle armor from the dollar store, you think you'd take it into a war with you? No. Maybe a Halloween costume, but probably not enough to go in battle. But we have armor from the best name in the business, from God. It's been tested and it's survived many battles over the years. And it's passed down from generation to generation to us too. It's not folklore, it's a real deal. And it's got the seal of approval from the Holy Spirit and from those who have survived with the battle armor and won. So it's armor you can trust. It's not dollar store junk. We just need to be able to trust, to make sure we trust it and trust in ourselves as other warriors in this fight with one another with the same end goal, heaven, our hope. So the pieces of armor I'm, I'm finally getting it at, the pieces of armor that I'm talking about today are the helmet and the sword, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now you really need all of the armor that God gives us which we'll be talking about the rest of the, the series. Last week, Ron talked about the breast pre, breastplate of righteousness that covers your heart, protects your heart and everything in here. Next week, Gabby's got uh, talking about the fancy shoes of the gospel or army boots, whatever you want to call them. And then Sarah has the belt of truth. And finally, Jeff, our new worship director, has the shield of faith. You need all these, otherwise you're gonna be left vulnerable in some area, and probably wounded or dead, spiritually. That's what I'm talking about, spiritually. This is, it's a spiritual war. Now, then, it, then you just leave the angels to clean up your mess, right? And so, once again, I want to give a contrast, because it's important if you, if you are in the family of God, that's great. If you are not quite there yet, there's this hope that's an assurance. And if you haven't, if you have questions, I want you to come and talk to somebody after service because it's incredibly important. So for those of you who have been saved by God's amazing grace, do you remember the day that it happened? How strong did you feel? I know I felt invincible. Nothing could touch me. But I was also encouraged by my life group, by the people that were surrounding me. Not to just sit on the sidelines, you know, like I was in, hey, I'm good. I was encouraged to learn more about the God who was actually leading the charge for me. And for those of you who are not quite there yet, you can have the confidence that Jesus wants you in, your fam in his family because he has created us as a masterpiece. And he's got a plan for us, each and every one. You just have to accept that and just say, I'm going to trust in you. I know it sounds easier than it can be done sometimes. So how many of you feel like there's a battle going on in your life? Huh? Do you feel like you're winning that battle? Don't you have times when you feel like, like overwhelmed and being overtaken by some enemy that you can't even see? Or maybe like the whole world's against you. Maybe these things are actually happening. Maybe it's not just perceived. These might be real battles you're fighting. Maybe you lost your job at the worst possible time and you're in debt up to your neck or you lost a loved one and you're really alone and afraid what the future looks like. You should not only have these other people standing by your side to fight this battle with you. Who else? You should have the king of kings in this fight with you. He's given you the helmet of salvation and it's like a titanium, I don't know, an umbrella covering you from anything that could harm you. What is it, what is it, you know, what kind of harm does it actually protect you from? About anything, really. Spiritual for sure. Maybe even physical at times. Maybe financial. But I will say this, God has a plan for your life and for whatever that is, he's not going to leave you defenseless. Do you want to follow that plan? That's the important question. Or do you think you can, you probably don't think you can do it on your own, not truly, but 
sometimes that's kind of what we do. We just don't ask for the help, either from each other or from God. So 1 Thessalonians, <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians, my voice is going out. I don't know why. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 11 says, you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. But you won't be surprised. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to the darkness and the night, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and clear-headed. Nighttime is when people sleep and drunkards get drink. Drink... Drinkers get drunk. <laughs> but let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Confidence. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. That's not what he created us for. Some feel that way, right? Some feel like he's a tyrant. God is not. Christ died so that whether we are dead or alive at the time he comes back, we can live with him forever. <clears throat> just as, you know, so encourage each other every day just as you are doing right now. So why is salvation likened to a helmet? Because it's a covering. It covers your whole life. Just look at what a helmet does and who wears them. Football, for instance. Football players are said to be locked in battle on the scrimmage line, right? Can you imagine going on the scrimmage line, one of those monsters, with no helmet? That'd be bad news that day. That'd be a bad day. Or going, if you're in the army, going into battle with no helmet. You know, you can take a, a hit to the chest or the, the leg or the arm, and you can survive. But taking a hit to the head, that usually leaves you dead. I'm sure we might be able to get lucky and survive. There's some that have, but I wouldn't want a chance at it. So how many of you have tons of luck on your side? No? Come on, somebody. No. Certainly not me. If I didn't have good luck, if I didn't have bad luck, I would have none. That's what I usually say. So this helmet of salvation covers your whole life. It's not just the head, but the metaphor of covering your head is important because it's what govern, your head is what governs your whole body. The thoughts you think, the way you act, what you do, the things you say, and what you learn. Your head governs your whole body. Um, you make huge decisions and tiny ones. Do you know how many decisions you make in a day on average? I looked this up. I was amazed. 35,000 decisions a day you know with somebody that's like a, a one decision every two seconds and so for somebody like me who has ADHD it's no wonder we cannot stay on track all right where was I <laughs> oh. so you're wearing the helmet of salvation and fully trust in the Lord can you still be sure that you're making the right decisions with all these decisions, and you're wearing the helmet of salvation, you have Jesus on your side, you should make every decision right. Yeah. No. I, you know, I play with those words and stuff because we just don't. We, we don't always get it right, right? Um, and some say that everything happens for a reason. I'm sure... <coughs> excuse me. I'm sure you've heard that before. I don't personally subscribe to that. If it's God's will, you know, if it happened, it must be God's will. So then what difference does it make? What decisions you make? Just make whatever. If God lets it happen, it must be his will. No, we got free will. Ooh, almost dumped those. We have free will, and that causes us to make decisions based on what we think is right at the time. And we don't always get it right. Here's what scripture tells us in Romans 8, chapter uh, 26, 27, and 8. I'm just kind of jumbling them together here. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. So we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Those who are calling 
uh, called according to his purpose. Not that everything happens for a reason, but God will work all these things for the good of those that, he, that love him because he has a plan for your life. You're his masterpiece. So the Holy Spirit intercedes for us when we're not sure what to pray for, not to sure what decisions we should make at any second and any day. God knows your heart and he will make all things right because you're covered by his helmet of salvation. If you're not... If you're not there, you're not sure, talk to one of us. That's huge. It's, a, it's the most important decision you will make in your life. Now, I don't think God cares whether you drive a Chevy or a Toyota. He just doesn't want you driving a Dodge. I talked to him about that. I'm joking. I just threw everybody who drives a Dodge under the bus. <laughs> But what he does care about is your relationship with him, your relationship with one another. That's what he cares about. So your decisions should be based on what is good for the kingdom of God, not just good for the kingdom of JC or whatever. Um, and when you get it wrong, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you in the right direction if you are listening to him. Sometimes we don't, I get it. Now, we're created by the God of all knowledge. So it makes sense that he would want us to use our brains, which, by the way, is covered by the helmet of salvation. And there's things in this world that we really do need to learn. That's why we go to school, learn things, how to survive in this world. When we're children, we don't really recognize the importance of going to school all the time. I hate math. I hate history. Uh, you know, English. Ugh. But... When we grow up and we get mature, we realize that these things help us in life. They help us get a job. They help us uh, in many ways, obviously. But the same, this goes the same thing for, the, for learning the word of God, the word that God gave us to live by. And so as we grow and mature in our salvation, we learn about how to live a more godly life because that's what he wants for us. We make mistakes. I, I thank God that he is much more forgiving than I can be. But this helmet protects our minds with the things that we learn in God's word. And to be good disciples, we should be disciplined so that he wants us to learn these things. Which brings me to the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So why is it called a sword? A sword, you know, a soldier always carries a weapon in the battle. And they're tasked with defending. That's why they have the sword. Well, we don't carry them these days, guns and whatever else, but... So you can't go against your enemy without a weapon. That would be crazy. The book of Hebrews says in four, chapter four, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. I know you've all heard that, but here's the part that got me. It penetrates even dividing the soul and the spirit. What? Joints and marrow. It judges your thoughts and your attitudes of your heart. It divides the soul and the spirit? I didn't imagine that could happen. The soul is what makes you you, right? It's your character, your personality, your experiences in life. It connects your body to who you are. But your spirit is who you are in connection to God in the spiritual realm, rather than your experiences here on earth. So it doesn't seem like you could split the two, who you are from your spirit. But the word is so powerful so sharp that it has the ability to even cut that. Now, I think there even could be a dual meaning in here. You think of the word, word. In Greek, the word, word is like spoken word or written word is rhema, R-H-E-M-A. But in this one, in John 1, 1, 2, the word that he uses is logos, which is used in relation to Jesus. This is cool. And the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus is the Word. And so in Matthew chapter 4, I'm bringing a lot of scripture into this. I hope I don't mess you up. But in Matthew chapter 4, you remember he's going into the desert after, right after being baptized by John the Baptist. And he's meeting, Satan meets him out in there. <laughs> to tempt him through all these things, right? And the word 
Jesus, who was there in the beginning, used the word, rhema, the spoken word, to get rid of Satan. That's how powerful the word is. There's absolutely no other written word or person with that kind of power. Nowhere. So in conclusion, God gives you everything that you need to combat the enemy and Satan. He, pr he provides us with a community of faithful warriors to stand and fight by our side and his ministering angels, a host of them to fight with us and the overarching protection of the helmet of salvation and all of this armor. He takes us from darkness to light and shows us that the real fight is not against one another. It's out in the spiritual realm. But don't let Satan deceive you into thinking that we're against each other because we're all broken in some way. Get God, get Jesus, fight the devil, not each other. Amen? Let's pray it out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just driving us to love you showing us how to love each other better better and i pray lord that we can have the spirit of unity not with just you but with one another and put on your full armor of god that you've given us so we can fight the real battle and not be deceived amen <laughs>